Museum of the Prefecture of Police in Paris showcases the most amazing collection of artifacts in France's history of crime. The spy hole through which Dr. Petio watched his victims agonize. The thin rope used to strangle bailiff Gouffe. Londru's boiler, knives, revolvers, and truncheons. All these weapons were used to commit the most heinous crimes. Since the 19th century, the police has relied on science to solve its investigations. Anthropometry, the study of the human iris, graphology, and morphopsychology are used. Inside the museum's archives, the reports of the investigations, the transcripts of the interrogations, and the sketches of the crime scenes take us along the bloody trail of the most terrible murderers in history. January 17, 1906. Armand Fallier is elected president of the Republic. A fervent abolitionist, the new head of state appoints Georges Clemenceau as council president, and a debate on the abolition of the death penalty is immediately put onto the agenda. Unfortunately, before the vote, a terrible crime occurs. In Paris, January 31, 1907, an 11-year-old girl, Marta Erbelding, is raped and murdered. Outraged, the press and public opinion demand the death penalty for the killer. The Assise Court of the Seine, unsurprisingly, condemns him to death to the applause of the crowd. Despite the opposition of the people, September 13, 1907, President Fallier commuted the death sentence of the murder to life imprisonment with hard labor. The press are incensed. Le Matin and the Le Petit Parisien organize a reader's poll. The results are unequivocal, with over one million people saying they're in favor of maintaining the death penalty. A year after the murderer's trial, despite the plea from Jean Jaurès defending abolition, the death penalty is maintained by 330 votes to 201. January 31, 1907, at the police station of Saint Antoine in the 11th arrondissement of Paris. Three people present themselves to the officer who is working until 10 p.m. Nicolas and Mary Erbelding report the disappearance of their daughter, little Marta, aged 11 and a half. They're accompanied by one of their friends, Albert Soleon. That afternoon, he'd taken her to a concert at the Bataclan, where the girl had slipped off and disappeared during the show. After searching in vain, they met at the station. Commissioner Oke had finished working at 5 p.m. The officer recorded the testimony and promised that everything would be done to find the child. commissariat de police, il faut se remettre dans le contexte de l'époque, euh, ce sont des commissariats de quartier. Et d'abord, le commissaire n'est pas là, parce qu'il ne peut pas être là 24 heures sur 24. Donc on est accueilli par un, son adjoint, qu'on appelle, le, le terme est intéressant, est un, son nom officiel, c'est un secrétaire de commissariat. Euh, plus tard, ils prendront le nom de commissaire adjoint, parce que c'est plus représentatif, c'est eux qui en fait font le boulot. Hein. Le commissaire de l'époque, c'est un magistrat très très bien payé, c'est un notable qui participe à toute, euh, toute la vie sociale, si vous voulez, du quartier, mais il ne fait pas beaucoup de présence au commissariat. Et donc, euh, il, il dit qu'il préviendra le commissaire le lendemain à son arrivée. Et un commissaire et, et un commissariat ne font pas de police judiciaire à l'époque. D'ailleurs, il n'en a pas le personnel, il a deux ou trois appariteurs. Ce fameux secrétaire de commissariat qu'on appelle, l'expression est intéressante, un chien, le chien du commissaire, c'est-à-dire qu'il fait tout le boulot, toutes les corvées et tout. Et, euh, mais il n'y a pas de policier, si vous voulez. Donc, il transmet... 
pense à une fugue, hein, on pense à beaucoup de choses, mais il transmet donc l'affaire à la brigade criminelle de la préfecture de police, qui est déjà à l'époque 36 quai des Orfèvres, hein, et, et euh, qui s'appelle la police judiciaire, elle s'appellera brigade criminelle en 1912, et euh, ce sont ces policiers-là qui vont enquêter. The investigation is assigned to Inspector Bormans. Albert Solion is the first questioned, as he's the last to have seen the girl. He says he went to the air buildings at 1 p.m. on January 31st. He'd received a free ticket to the concert at the Beta Cologne and offered it to little Martin. He said his wife would accompany the girl once she came home from work. Seeing her daughter's delight at the offer, Mrs. Airbuilding agreed. So Solion leads Marta home, thinking his wife would be there. But she couldn't get the time off. Not to disappoint the child, he decided to accompany her himself. They arrive at the music hall at 2.10 p.m. and sit in the balcony. Around 3 p.m., Marta asks to use the toilet. When she hasn't returned after 10 minutes, Albert goes to look for her, but there's no trace of the little girl. At 3.30 p.m., he decides to go home to see if by any chance she's gone back to his apartment. He questions the neighbors, the shopkeepers, but no one has seen her. So Leon goes to the girl's parents. In turmoil, the whole family rushes to look for her, but to no avail. It's later in the evening when they decide to go to the police. They then continue their search at the hospitals. But no little girl has been in an accident. Albert Solion is 26. On October 6, 1906, he married Juliette Bremard, with whom he'd lived since 1998. It was at this time that he met the Airbuilding family and their children Eugène, Cyril, Lucien, little Marta, to which he is very attached, and Maria, the youngest. Albert and Juliette have a son, Camille, who's three years old. The two families are very close and share the terrible misfortune that has struck them. Three leads open up to investigators. Firstly, the presence of a man who's been seen wandering in the neighborhood. After interviewing the caretaker of the building where the Airbuilding family lives, 76 Rue Saint-Maur, it appears that an individual aged 45 to 50 years wearing a dark suit, a cape, and yellow shoes has been seen accosting young girls, trying to lead them away while indulging them in obscene acts. Little Marta was thought to have been accosted by this individual. February 1st, between 5 and 7.30 p.m., the police set up surveillance in the boiler room where the suspect was last seen. The trap door doesn't work and the man does not appear. The second lead followed by the inspectors is that of a gang of thugs hanging around the Bataclone, assaulting artists and customers of the cabaret. It's alleged that these thugs are involved in human trafficking. Il y a une insécurité importante, euh, une insécurité en fait qui a toujours existé, mais qui prend un visage particulier avec en particulier ce monde des apaches euh, qui va fasciner euh, la bourgeoisie et la petite bourgeoisie. En fait, il y a toujours eu une délinquance urbaine à Paris, il y a toujours eu une grande violence euh, dans la ville et euh, dans sa périphérie, mais 
la figure de l'Apache va euh, en quelque sorte cristalliser tous les fantasmes. Euh, c'est d'abord l'affaire Casque d'Or qui va euh, rendre visibles ces Apaches, la grande presse va s'en emparer et cette délinquance à laquelle on ne prêtait peut-être pas une grande attention va occuper le devant de la scène avec toute une série d'affaires qui parfois sont de toutes petites choses, des rixes au couteau, des tortures, des règlements de compte, mais qui vont littéralement fasciner les Français de l'époque, à tel point qu'une mode va être créée. Il est vrai que ces Apaches sont assez fascinant. D'abord, leur jeunesse. Certains sont mineurs ou alors ce sont de très jeunes hommes. Euh, la page ne travaille pas. Dans une société comme la société française sous la Troisième République qui a fait du travail sa valeur centrale, hein, c'est le travail et le mérite qui vous permettent d'accéder aux plus hautes fonctions, c'est la provocation majeure de refuser toute espèce de travail. La page vole, la page est généralement un jeune proxénète. L'Apache parfois tue, c'est pas un assassin de profession, mais il a le coup de sur infacile. Et puis l'Apache euh, est un peu dandy, il présente beau, il est coquet. Il a une ceinture rouge en toile euh, qui euh, le met en valeur, qui lui serre la taille. Il a une casquette à pont, il a un petit foulard. Euh, il est assez coquet, il est assez beau, cet Apache. Euh, C'est un charme canaille, bien sûr, mais euh, qui s'exerce aussi bien sur les filles des rues euh, qu'il va tout simplement prostituer euh, que sur les dames des beaux quartiers qui vont frissonner à l'idée de pouvoir aller guincher euh, dans des balles où on va peut-être croiser de véritables Apaches. The director of the Bataclan, Mr. Habricorn, had warned the police about the violence some time ago. Patrols were organized and the band of thugs had recently disappeared. The third lead is the woods at Vincennes, not far from where little Marta disappeared. Rumor suggests that there are child traffickers in the woods and the lakes could contain her corpse. Inspector Bormans decides to follow this lead. He meets Mr. Georges Lefebvre, guardian of walks from Paris to Vincennes. The lakes were frozen on January 24th, 25th, 26th, and 27th. The public was able to skate there. From January 28th to February 2nd, the ice melted around the edges, but given the shallow depth, it seems impossible that a corpse could stay there without being spotted by a passerby. Ou, enfin, et les années qui précèdent et qui suivent, euh, c'est une époque, euh, je dirais, marquée par un paradoxe. C'est la belle époque, comme chacun sait, donc une époque de prospérité économique, de, de re, très relative harmonie euh, sociale. Or, euh, on n'a jamais parlé autant qu'à ce moment-là d'insécurité, euh, même si ce n'est pas vraiment le terme qui est utilisé, euh, et on n'a jamais parlé autant de criminalité. La presse populaire doit une partie de son succès commercial au fait qu'elle publie chaque jour des récits de crimes, de délits, d'accidents et de suicides aussi, puisqu'ils font partie des faits divers. Euh, et donc, évidemment, cette, cette création de séries criminelles euh, suscite euh, certainement auprès d'un lectorat avide de ces lectures-là, parce que c'est des lectures qui n'exigent, qui sont faciles. Hein. Le, pu le public euh, se peut en effet être impressionné par, euh, par, par ces récits et considérer qu'il vit dans une société qui est de plus en plus marquée par la criminalité. Ceci euh, peut aussi indiquer une transformation des sensibilités. Hein. Quand on se met à, à dénoncer l'insécurité, ça ne veut pas forcément dire que l'insécurité augmente, que la criminalité augmente, ça peut tout simplement vouloir dire qu'on devient plus sensible à la criminalité, moins tolérant, et que des violences qui faisaient jusqu'alors partie de la vie quotidienne, de quelque chose de, de toléré, disons, ne sont désormais plus tolérées parce que précisément on atteint un degré de civilisation entre guillemets, qui n'autorise qui plus cette tolérance-là. All the leads reach dead ends, and Albert Solion is brought back in for questioning. He had some dealings with the law in the past, and had even been investigated for embezzlement. Sunday, February 3rd at 6 a.m., inspectors Burke and De Hol go to 133 Rue de Charonne, home of the Solions. His wife, Juliette, opens the door. Albert is still in bed. Inspectors then ask him to follow them. He doesn't object. 
he dresses, kisses his son, and leaves with the police. The deputy head of police, the chief inspector Lebrun, will hear his testimony. Albert Solion confidently repeats previous statements verbatim. His visit to Madame Erbelding. His proposal to take little Marta to the Bataclan with the free ticket he'd been given. He again explains that his wife was not able to get time off work, so he decided to take Marta with him to the show. It was 2.10 in the afternoon. We ordered two lattes, which were served by a boy aged 30 to 35 years old, of medium height, with a mustache. I paid one franc 20 for them, explained Albert. Around three, Mart went to the bathroom. After 10 minutes, when she did not return, Albert began to look, first inside the establishment, then around the outside. About half past three, he returned home, asking if anyone had seen the girl. Then I went over to Madame Erbelding's and I explained what had happened. Chief Inspector Lebrun found that Solion's story lacked detail, so he asked him to accompany him to the Bataclan in order to confirm his statement. spectacle effectivement pour les familles le, en particulier le, le jeudi après-midi puisque le jeudi c'était le c'était la c'était notre mercredi aujourd'hui pour les écoles et donc euh, il y avait un spectacle certainement de chanteurs de chanteuses d'animation il y avait peut-être aussi des animations genre clown ou ou acrobate ou choses comme ça qui étaient vraiment famille parce que bien sûr, je ne vous parle pas de certains spectacles qui, le soir, eux, étaient beaucoup plus osés. Pour l'époque, bien sûr, ce qui nous ferait rigoler aujourd'hui. Mais c'est-à-dire les femmes en tenue couleur chair, ce qu'on appelait le nu, et le, non pas le striptease, mais le nu, les, les revues nues, et qui en fait étaient très habillées hein, pour, par rapport à ce qu'on voit aujourd'hui. <rire> Il y avait beaucoup de personnel parce qu'il y avait non seulement euh, des ouvreuses, bien sûr, placières, mais en plus il y avait les garçons qui servaient euh, aux tables. Hein. Donc euh, c'était assez contrôlé, il y avait du monde, hein, il y avait du monde. Et puis le personnel ne coûtait pas euh, ce qu'il coûte aujourd'hui. Donc on, euh, il, y avait, il y avait beaucoup de monde. L'équipe, euh, euh, c'était une énorme salle. Et donc euh, même, même pour les matinées euh, du mercredi, euh, je pense qu'il y avait du monde. In the presence of the Bataclan's director, Solion retraced the path he'd taken in the establishment with the little girl. He said that he'd been given two red tickets to the first floor balcony. The manager then pointed out that tickets allowing access to the balcony were green. Among the employees, nobody remembered Solion and the little Marta, but there are so many customers. He then points out two armchairs, number 155 and 157, where they were sitting. Asked about the show, he said he saw a young woman opening, when in fact it was a man by the name of Brettany who opened first. The manager brings them over to the waiters who worked during the show, but none remembers Solion. Mrs. Dutreuil, the lady in charge of the toilets, does not remember having seen a girl fitting Marta's description. Back at the station, Solion is imprisoned. It was discovered that he was wanted for embezzlement. On May 31st, 1902, he stole the 1,000 franc note that his employer at the time, Mr. Picard, had entrusted him to change. He moved the same day without leaving an address. And since then, he was actively being sought by the police. With Solion detained, the investigation continues. The inspectors go back to question Mrs. Erbelding, who describes precisely how Solion took Marta to the show. 
He said he came to take the girl home where his wife, who was having lunch, was waiting to take her to the concert at the Bataclan. He added that it was his wife who sent him, as he had to start work at two in the afternoon. Seeing the joy of the child, she acquiesced, saying, If it's to go with Julienne, that's fine. Albert replied, Do you think it's to go with me? I told you I have to work at two. Mrs. Erbelding then dressed Mart in a clean dress and a new hat. So Leon hurried her to get dressed. Hurry, Mart, he said. Julianne is waiting for you and I'll be late because I have to start work at two o'clock. It seemed more and more that Albert's testimony was confused, perhaps because of the emotion the disappearance of the girl provoked in him. On February 5th, 1907, the press got hold of the case. Le Petit Parisien headline said, Unexplained disappearance of a little girl, Marta Erbelding, has she been killed? All the papers report her strange disappearance. In the public opinion, there's a crime epidemic, and not a day goes by without the press reporting sordid or bloody crimes, gangs spreading terror throughout France. Reporters gather all the information they can get on what they feel will be a sensational crime. C'est-à-dire que la presse s'est industrialisée. On est depuis les années 1880-90 dans l'âge des rotatives, c'est-à-dire qu'on tire des journaux non plus à la feuille, ce qui était long et coûteux, mais par, dans, par des bandes de papier qui se déroulent presque indéfiniment dans des rotatives, c'est beaucoup moins coûteux. Donc se développe une presse à un sou, un sou c'est 5 centimes, tout le monde peut se payer un journal. Euh, les tirages s'accroissent, les porteurs de journaux, se répandent dans les rues euh, et donc vont toucher tous les publics. Euh, un journal comme le Petit Journal euh, ambitionne de toucher aussi bien euh, les, le bourgeois que la concierge, que le petit artisan, que l'ouvrier. Euh, et donc euh, on arrive à des tirages très impressionnants. Le Petit Journal, euh, à partir de 1890, c'est un million d'exemplaires imprimés. Donc euh, facilement 2 à 3 millions de lecteurs, sachant qu'un exemplaire va, va circuler dans la famille. C'est une puissance importante. Cette presse qui se développe, c'est une presse qui est de plus en plus illustrée. Et à partir de 1890, le Petit Journal va même avoir un supplément illustré avec deux grandes gravures en couleur. Et pour des Français qui sont habitués à une presse en noir et blanc, euh, l'irruption de la couleur, et même de couleurs assez crues, eh bien ça change tout, ça donne l'illusion du vrai. Euh, ces gravures peuvent nous paraître un peu désuètes, un peu étranges, avec nos yeux d'aujourd'hui, nous qui sommes saturés d'images et d'images en couleur. Mais à l'époque, c'était une grande nouveauté. Et bien sûr, les faits divers vont occuper une place importante dans cette imagerie populaire qui se développe avec la grande presse. Inutile de dire que les apaches, et de façon générale les crimes, euh, c'est pain béni pour cette presse qui va attiser ce sentiment d'insécurité euh, auprès en particulier de la population urbaine. February 6th. At the police station, it's decided to re-interview Solion. He repeats and confirms his statement that he was in the Bataclan with little Marta. February 7th, the head of the police, the divisional commissioner Amar, sends a circular asking all commissioners to forward any information regarding the disappearance of Marta Airbuilding. The press feeds the drama, and attention is starting to turn to Solion. Did he lose her or sell her, is the headline in La Matin. That same day, Inspector Bormons will interview a key witness, Mrs. Lepsch lives on 122 Rue de Charonne, opposite Solion's apartment. On January 31st, she returned home at half past two. On the way home, I opened my dining room window to check the time on the clock hanging in front of the jewelry shop at 119 Rue de Charonne, she said. When I opened the window, I noticed a girl at Mr. Solion's window. I looked at the time. It was exactly half past two. Closing the window, I saw Solion next to the little girl. He let her in and closed the door. The next day, February 8th, Solion is taken out of his cell to confront him with Mrs. Lepsch, 
who confirmed having seen him at half past two with the girl at the window of his apartment. He replied that she is mistaken because at quarter past two, he was at the show at the Bataclan. So Leon is then confronted with different employees from the Bataclan. No one recognizes him, and the worker in charge of seating on the first floor balcony says he never sat Solion and Little Mart on January 31st. Mr. Lemoyte, controller at the Bataclan, claims not to have seen them either. Since Solion insists he intended the concert, he asks the name of the artists who sang that day. I remember Minotti, and especially Mrs. Godet struck me with her vulgar songs. Mr. Lemoyt retorts, Mrs. Godet did not sing that day. It became evident that Solion had not attended the show. What had happened to Little Mart? Intervient donc euh, ce que l'on appelle à l'époque la cuisine hein, dans la police, c'est-à-dire qu'en fait il faut que l'aveu étant la reine des preuves, il faut qu'un accusé se mette à table. Hein, les expressions sont intéressantes, cuisine, se mettre à table et tout, euh, soleillant. Comme il est sous le coup d'une condamnation par contumace qu'il a, euh, il n'a jamais euh, évidemment. Euh, Purger, ça permet, est, on n'est plus dans le domaine de la garde à vue, on, on, le, on le maintient au dépôt puisqu'il est dans le... Et là, ça permet de l'interroger tous les jours, tous les jours, tous les jours. So Lyon is then confronted with his contradictions. The lies he told Mrs. Airbuilding to convince her to let her daughter go with him. It's my wife who will accompany her. I have to be at work at 2 p.m. Details about the concert at the Bataclan which he never attended. The story he told Marta's parents, who trusted him, playing the desperate friend who had failed to protect the little girl. The police don't give in, and they push him into a corner. Finally, he cracks. Okay, he says, it was me. Crying, he says, I request that you ignore what I've said so far. I want to tell the truth now. So Leon then gives this first version. I thought my wife would be at home when I left the air buildings with little Marta. My wife wasn't there, but I still wanted to go to the concert. I don't want to go without Julienne, said little Marta. I teased her, I played with her, and then I wanted to caress her and make her stay because she wanted to go home to her parents. Wanting to keep her here, I felt the body of this girl in my arms I squeezed her and she screamed. To prevent her screaming, I tightened my grip around her throat. She fell lifeless, dead. Then I took some sacking that I had at home. I folded the body slightly. I covered her head with a coat. I took everything to the railroad station and I put it in the left luggage. I didn't rape the child. I was crazy. I apologize for what I did. After his confession, Solion was quickly taken to the left luggage of the railway station. The package containing the body of little Marta bore the number 1274. It was left on January 31st at 5.10 p.m. under the name of Paris. The package weighed 31 kilos 500 grams and contained the body of the girl. At the sight of the corpse, Solion gave new details. He said that while playing with Mart, he touched the child's genitals, and then he wanted to possess her. Et le crime a provoqué une émotion particulière, sans doute à cause de l'attitude du criminel. Le fait qu'il soit le meilleur ami de la famille, le fait qu'il ait menti pendant huit jours continuellement, le fait qu'il ait, euh, qu ait participé aux recherches, qu'il ait donné l'impression euh, d'être totalement solidaire de la famille, alors qu'il savait pertinemment qu'il avait tué, violé la gamine, et il savait où était le corps qu'il avait caché. Euh, ça, ça a beaucoup euh, révolté l'opinion. C'est le crime de trop qu'elle Quelque part, euh, euh, il a bouleversé l'opinion. Alors pourquoi euh, C'est difficile à dire. Soleillon n'est pas un euh, napache. Hein. C'est un marginal. C'est plutôt un fils de bonne famille qui a d'ailleurs ruiné et désespéré ses parents. Euh, C'est un 
type qui vit de petites escroqueries, d'abus de confiance, euh, qui déménage à la cloche de bois, qui, qui n'arrive jamais à garder un emploi, euh, qui est d'ailleurs euh, sous le coup de plusieurs condamnations par contumace. Hein. Euh, ça aussi, ça interrogé les gens. Euh, voilà quelqu'un qui est condamné, euh, qui vivait quand même au grand jour, pas sous un faux nom et qu'on ne retrouve pas, qui ne purge pas sa peine, etc. Euh, ça, ça a beaucoup inquiété l'opinion, parce qu'on se dit que s'il avait payé, euh, s'il n'avait pas connu cette espèce d'impunité, peut-être aurait-il été plus méfiant, hein. peut-être ne se serait-il pas. Enfin, c'est comme ça qu'on a interprété les choses. The next day, February 9th, the press reports the horrible outcome in every newspaper headline. He killed her, announces Le Matin, showing the photo of the murderer and his victim. Solion murdered little Mart, the monster has confessed, declares Le Petit Parisien. Solion killed little Mart, raped, murdered, says l'humanité. The public is horrified. On Sunday, February 10th, Dr. Courtois Soufi carries out an autopsy on the victim. His report determines that the girl was a victim of attempted strangulation. Her death was due to perforation of the heart with a knife. There were many injuries to the genitals, showing she'd been raped. February 14, 1907. The funeral of the little Mart is held. A large crowd accompanies the casket. The convoy passes between two rows of children and mothers crying, l'humanité wrote. 50,000 people join Little Mart's procession, is the headline in Le Matin. 100,000 people at Little Mart's funeral, adds Le Petit Parisien, which also writes, Never has crime so violently roused public opinion than for Solion's vile crime, drawing this innocent victim into a trap, assaulting and raping her, strangling her and then stabbing her through the heart with a knife. The people of Paris, distraught, demand justice. When pressed by reporters, the murderer's wife, Julienne, says her husband sometimes had violent outbursts. In April 1902, Solion had hit her with a stylus. The scar is still visible near her right breast. In March 1906, He attacked his sister-in-law, Julia, trying to rape her. He grabbed me, knocked me down, and threw me to the foot of the bed in the room. Holding me down, he pulled out the knife that was in his pocket and said, I want you to be mine, and if you ever resist me again, I'll pierce your heart with this dagger. But she escaped him by pretending to give in and then running away as soon as his back was turned. At the time, she had not filed a complaint, for fear of bringing scandal on the family. Each day, more and more sordid details were added to the portrait of the monster, and his wife eventually disowns him. This monster has nothing for me or for my son. His heinous act has created an unbridgeable gap between us. Et un autre personnage qui est fascinant dans toute cette enquête, c'est évidemment la femme de, de, de Soleillon, femme extrêmement séduisante, hein, dont j'en ai pas la preuve, hein, mais il m'a semblé à travers les enquêtes et autres qu'elle s'est livrée plus ou moins à la prostitution euh, et que en fait c'est son mari hein, qui euh, l'a forcée à se prostituer quand le, le couple avait des ennuis d'argent ou que lui était au chômage comme d'habitude. Alors d'abord, ce qui est intéressant, c'est qu'elle travaille dans une industrie folle, hein, elle, elle, des baleines de parapluie, <rire> et qui sont de, de, de vrais euh, restes de baleines, hein, bien sûr, qu'on utilise. Et puis, bon, elle est très belle, évidemment, elle est très érotique, hein, on sent d'ailleurs que le couple a beaucoup fonctionné là-dessus. Elle a une attitude à l'égard de son mari étonnante, elle dit à la fois qu'il lui fait peur, qu'il l'effrayait, euh, comme si elle était un peu prisonnière, mais en même temps, on a des tas de témoignages qui montrent qu'elle était... Euh, elle avait pour lui, beaucoup d'indulgence. Hein. A crowd of onlookers gathers around the building of the crime at 133 Rue de Charonne, and it seems the only conclusion to this case is the guillotine. The trial begins July 23, 1907, and lasts only two days. The room is full when at a quarter past 12, the killer of Little Mart enters. Emotions run high, 
and everybody stands to see the monster close up. Solio is not troubled. Wanting to look good, his hair is meticulously styled, and his mustache is carefully teased up at each end. He's smiling. His eyes, one brown and the other light green, give him a curious look. Despite his best efforts, he doesn't come off as likable. Rather, he seems sneaky, cold, and unfeeling. At the beginning of the hearing, the President Baffre gives the jury a picture of Mart's little corpse taken after the heinous crime. He then paints the picture of the accused. He sums up Solion's life. Thieving from his father at the age of 15, stealing goods from his family that he sold on the streets, living off the prostitution of his future wife. His different employers reported a violent character that he demonstrated when wounding his wife with a stylus and trying to abuse his sister-in-law. So Leon is no longer flaunting himself. He hides behind the wall that separates him from his lawyer, his head in his hands, moaning. Then comes the description of the murder of the little Mart. I don't remember, he replies to the president. When Mrs. Airbelding takes the stand, a heavy silence falls in the room. So Leon looks down. He can't face the painful look of the mother of little Mart. A dignified figure, she makes no threatening gestures and shows no anger. Only the trembling of her voice and the sadness of her face ravaged by pain, showing her indignation and hurt. The session of July 24th begins with the argument of Mr. André Hess for the prosecution. Solion is one of the most complete criminals, the most cynical that we have ever seen. He is cruel, hard-hearted, and an insensitive soul. Addressing the jury, he says, a verdict of weakness on your part would panic the public. They would wonder where in this lamentable case you could possibly find any elements to excuse this man who in such a short time was a thief, a pimp, and a murderer. The crowd applauds loudly. It was then the turn of the public prosecutor, Mr. Trouard Riol, who concluded his argument with this sentence. In a human body, when a limb is gangrenous, it's cut off. In a society, when there is a monster, he is eliminated. It is a duty that you must carry out. There are stains that can only be erased with blood. The audience is in a trance. Mr. Robert Bernstein, counsel for the defense, will be hard-pressed to prove that there was no premeditation, that Solion had a single fit of rage where he lost his mind and he was unaware of the act he was committing. He asks for mitigating circumstances to be considered. The jurors then retire to deliberate. At half past four, the bell rings announcing their return. The verdict is final. Solion is found guilty of all the charges against him and sentenced to the death penalty. The accused is destroyed. His wife Julienne jumps up and cries out to the man who was her husband. Wretched man, she screams at him. You've disgraced your child. And trying to rush to the dock, she yells, Let me kill him, let me. But strong arms hold her back. The question that everyone is asking is, when will Solion be executed? And will he really be executed? Since taking office, Armand Fallier, President of the Republic, has consistently pardoned all prisoners sentenced to death. Fervent abolitionist, he hopes that the law abolishing the death penalty that the Minister of Justice, Mr. Guyot de Seigne, proposed to the House will soon be passed. Hier, a pratiqué une politique de grâce systématique. C'est un abolitionniste et il a mis ses actes en conformité avec ses convictions. Par conséquent, 
dès qu'il a été élu, il a commencé à gracier. Et évidemment, l'opposition de droite en a profité pour dénoncer ce qui était contraire à la volonté du juré. Cependant, je considère, quand on regarde la situation politique et parlementaire de l'époque, que l'heure de l'abolition avait sonné. Vous aviez une majorité importante de gauche, c'était après l'affaire Dreyfus, euh, fort parti radical, euh, par conséquent avec une influence de l'Église réduite au Parlement, plus réduite que d'habitude. Vous aviez Clément Saudon, qui connaissait les conventions abolitionnistes comme président du Conseil, et une majorité. J'ajoute que le garde des Sceaux, premier mais surtout le second brillant, était un homme du premier talent, donc euh, toutes les conditions paraissaient réunies euh, pour l'abolition. Et je, je considérais qu'elle aurait dû intervenir en ce moment-là. But public opinion is not ready to accept such a decision after such a horrible crime, and the press is of the same opinion. The problem is that the place of Parisian executions, in front of the Roquette prison is no longer usable as the stones that served as the foundation for the guillotine were removed. You can always guillotine, claims Le Petit Parisien, who says that according to the police department, they're considering installing the guillotine on Rue Messi. It runs along the wall of the jail where Solion is incarcerated. A door would give access to this little street, which can easily be controlled by the police. Far from these concerns, in his cell, Solion is calm again. His fellow inmates reassure him that there will be no more executions. His sentence will be commuted to hard labor. Once sent to the colonies for hard labor, he'll be able to start a new life in the tropics. July 31st, Le Petit Parisien reports that the condemned man lives in a dream. A Protestant pastor visits him every day encouraging these illusions. Mr. Fallier will grant clemency and irreproachable conduct in the penal colonies will allow you to rebuild your life, he's told. L'image du bagne de Guyane, c'est plutôt une image idyllique. La presse pas en, ne s'est pas encore fait le relais euh, des dures conditions de vie euh, en Guyane. Et euh, souvent, on assiste à euh, une réaction très positive, voire optimiste, hein, des condamnés qui se disent que fatalement, euh, là-bas, c'est un petit peu un Éden et qu'ils vont pouvoir euh, refaire leur vie, redémarrer euh, dans de bonnes conditions. Solion already sees himself there. I will be very happy and nearly free. Maybe I could one day have a horse and a small car to drive around the island. I will organize my little house as I like. The administration will provide food. I will just have to let myself live. These are the words of the murderer transcribed in the newspaper and that fuel public resentment. September 12, 1907. Applications for the pardon of four convicted men arrive on the desk of President Fallier. Solion is among them. The president knows that the public is not ready to accept mercy for the killer of Little Mart. He himself is not immune to the horror of the crime. But his conviction to abolish the death penalty is stronger. And he commutes the sentence to life imprisonment with hard labor. Condamné à mort, mais le président Fallière le gracie. Alors attention, on le gracie, ça ne veut pas dire qu'il est libre, bien sûr. En fait, sa peine de mort est commuée en travaux forcés à perpétuité. Mais pour un assassin d'enfant et un personnage aussi veule, aussi détestable, euh, c'est insupportable pour l'opinion. Il y a eu un dessin célèbre où on l'a représenté comme un planteur euh, avec un beau chapeau de paille, une chaise longue, euh, dans un décor luxuriant. Bon, évidemment, le bagne, ça n'est pas ça. Mais les Français ne le savent pas ou ne veulent pas le savoir. La grande presse va utiliser cette affaire pour remettre la guillotine au cœur du débat et pour dire la peine de mort a des vertus d'exemplarité, il faut la maintenir. 
The press is incensed. The monsters pardon. The killer's life saved. Three days later, violent demonstrations explode in the streets. Public indignation is at its peak. In Place Vendôme, over 600 people shout, put him to death, we want justice. September 20th, 1907, the pardons are endorsed. Solio is no longer condemned to death. He becomes the property of the prison administration as a convict and taken into custody. At 10 p.m., he's woken up with a start, led to Montparnasse Station. The train to La Rochelle leaves at 11.25 p.m. The prisoner is installed in the cell car number 50. On arrival at 1.30 p.m. the next day, he's transferred to the convict detention in Saint-Martin-en-Ray. Prisoner number 5249 will wait there until his departure for Guyana. Dès 1873, Saint-Martin devient le dépôt officiel euh, de tous les condamnés en partance euh, pour le bagne. Et euh, lorsque Soleillant passe euh, en 1907 euh, à Saint-Martin-de-Ré, eh bien, il va euh, être euh, mélangé parmi les trois catégories de condamnés au bagne, à savoir les transportés dont il faisait partie, qui sont euh, les condamnés de cour d'assises, les criminels de sang, condamnés aux travaux forcés avec euh, également les déportés, les déportés politiques dont euh, fera partie euh, Dreyfus ou Henri de Rochefort, et euh, la dernière catégorie de condamnés au bagne euh, qui constitue la masse, euh, qui sont les relégués. Euh, C'est ce qui va aussi beaucoup émouvoir l'opinion publique hein, puisque ce sont des multirécidivistes qui ont été condamnés quatre fois en France et qui eux vont partir également à vie au bagne. Et en 1907, eh bien, euh, les condamnés partent déjà depuis le port euh, principal de Saint-Martin-de-Ré. Donc ils traversent le bois de la Barbette, qu'on va appeler euh, également l'allée des Soupirs, euh, en direction du Clé Clémenceau, où là, une foule euh, généralement massive les attend, malgré les, les arrêtés municipaux. Euh, C'est un spectacle euh, où chacun euh, vient assister. Et on a des vapeurs, comme l'Express ou le Codini, qui vont embarquer tous ces condamnés jusqu'au bateau bagne, comme le Loire, qui les attend au rade de Saint-Martin. At the same time, Le Petit Parisien launches a major campaign for or against the death penalty, for which it'll get a huge amount of input from its readers. All the press follows the movement, even the Times in London. The big referendum of Le Petit Parisien, expected to last until October 25th, is so successful that it's extended on November 5, 1907, the results are announced. Those four, 1,083,655, against 329,000. The die is cast. The people have spoken. December 20th, 1907, on the ship La Loire, Solio and 450 other convicts reach Guyana. The Eden that he finds is very far from his dreams. Enlisted in the third class, he was assigned to the toughest jobs. Hated by all, in 1912 he tries to seduce a young convict, but is rejected by the object of his lust. He goes into a rage and assaults the young man who defends himself and injures Solion with a knife. Weakened, he contracts tuberculosis, which finally kills Little Mart's assassin in 1920. The debate on the abolition of the death penalty will be submitted to the Chamber of Deputies on June 12, 1908, a year after the trial of Solion. The press continues to highlight the insecurity in France. Only the newspaper L'Humanité, whose political director is Jean Jaurès, seeks to defend the cause for abolition. In the Chamber of Deputies, Maurice Barres, a strong supporter of the death penalty, debates against Jean Jaurès, who rejects the sentence as disgusting and appeals to the Assembly's Christian humanism. Despite the will of the government and the conviction of Armand Fallière, on December 8, 1908, the bill will be postponed by 330 votes against 201. La plus grande originalité de l'affaire Soleillan et politique, c'est-à-dire l'utilisation d'un euh, soi-disant référendum euh, en faisant pétitionner des millions de lecteurs pour avoir euh, comme ça euh, un courant d'opinion publique qu'on peut utiliser 
euh, contre un projet de loi. C'est peut-être ça l'enseignement politique à en tirer pour le reste. C'est une tragédie. Un enfant est assassiné. C'est ensuite euh, un processus judiciaire à l'époque qui n'avait rien d'extraordinaire, mais qui l'a débouché sur un, un grand affrontement politique, politique et moral. From 1909, executions were resumed. President Fallier, not daring to use his right to pardon in the face of a fearful society eager for a discourse about security. It wasn't until September 18th, 1981, despite public opinion still being largely opposed, that the National Assembly adopted by 363 votes to 117 the law abolishing the death penalty. La guillotine est au musée, qui est le lieu à lequel je, je destinais depuis longtemps. Elle est au musée. L'opinion publique est en majorité contre le rétablissement de la peine de mort, et spécialement dans les nouvelles générations. Euh, chez les personnes âgées, il est resté une sorte, euh, je ne dirais pas de nostalgie, mais euh, ils ont été sensibilisés différemment des jeunes générations, et euh, il en a été ici comme dans tous les autres États européens. Non, en, en, en réalité, vous remarquez d'ailleurs qu'il y a toujours quelques démagogues euh, qui posent, ah, il y a un crime affreux, il faut rétablir la peine de mort. Pure démagogie, pourquoi je dis pure démagogie Parce que c'est impossible. Pas, euh, il faut bien mesurer le chemin parcouru depuis 1981. D'abord, en 1985, la France a ratifié le protocole numéro 6 à la Convention européenne des droits de l'homme, qui interdit à tous les États signataires le recours à la peine de mort. C'est le dernier texte que j'ai fait voter à l'Assemblée nationale et au Sénat. C'est le dernier, en fait, de ma carrière ministérielle. Il y a à cet égard un ensemble, mais très euh, cohérent, et en même temps, je dirais, indestructible, l'abolition, elle est irréversible. Donc, quand j'entends glapir ou clamer « Ah, ah, la guillotine, ah, vite, la peine de mort, la peine de mort va nous protéger », c'est fini. Ça fait partie de l'histoire. The guillotine's blade continued to fall for 72 years. The last execution took place on September 10th, 1977, in Marseille. The murder of little Mart Erbelding would have pushed back the abolition of the death penalty by three quarters of a century.